Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Creatives with Vodka. Cre- <laughs> now I've screwed up already. The Creatives with AI podcast, the spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. future. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Creatives with AI podcast. I'm your host, David. And on today's show, we have Father Joe Evans. Father Joe is a Catholic priest and he's a member of the Catholic organization Opus Dei. Father Joe was born in London, studied French and Portuguese at King's College, and later did a a doctorate in biblical theology at the University of Navarre in Spain. He's also a writer, journalist, and communicator in various forms of media, and and is co-founder and editorial director of the online magazine Adama Media, and lead coordinator of the Catholic podcast series 10 Minutes with Jesus. I've been really excited to have uh, someone a priest on and someone from the spiritual community to come and talk about AI and how I think AI and morals and everything fits into that. So I'm really excited to talk to Father Joe. So Father Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I thought maybe, I guess, just start off a little bit and just give a little bit more of your background, because I assume there's probably a bit more of it than than that. Um, And just let everybody kind of know to give us a little bit of context about what your background is and where you're coming from. Okay, well, I'm a very proud Londoner. I love London. I was born, as, a, as, a, as, a, as you said, I was born and brought up in London. But I've also been very happy and blessed to live outside of London in various places. Uh, Spain, Rome, uh, Portugal for my studies, a bit of time in France too. I'm a great Francophile and Lucifer, love of Portugal. Um, I love, I've, I've been, I've, the Lord has taken me ooh, about 10 years to Manchester. I've had bl- very blessed years in Manchester. I've just come from Manchester. I'm now based here in Oxford at a place called Grand Pont House, which is a centre of Opus Dei here in Manchester. Um, I, yeah, I, I have worked as a journalist. I, st- I now run this online magazine called Adama Media, uh, which tries to bring people together in a sort of to form bonds, to overcome ghettos, to help people overcome beyond, go beyond tribalism. It's, one of, it's something that's very dear to me. Um, and, um, and I work a lot with young people, which I love. Brilliant. And can you explain for people listening, because I assume most people listening probably aren't going to know what Opus Dei is, and probably their only experience is going to has been through a Dan Brown film or a book or something <laughs> yes, like that. Indeed. And I'm sure yes. you come across this all the time, but yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a good place to start, I think, just so everybody, again, can have a little bit of context. Great, of course. In the end, Dan Brown did us a lot of good because it was a great chance for us to tell people lots and lots about Opus Day. So he meant to do us harm, but he did us good. Um, Opus Day is was founded by the Spanish priest Saint Jose Maria uh, in 1928. He was he died in 1975 and was made canonized, was made a saint by Pope John Paul II in 2002. And his big idea, what God made him see, was that all people are called to holiness. And that you don't have to be a priest, you don't have to be a monk or a nun. Everybody's called to holiness through their ordinary everyday life. So it's very much making holy the ordinary. Um, So most of them, although you've got here a priest talking, uh, I myself, before being a priest, was a journalist and a youth worker. And most of our members, um, at least least over 90 percent, are ordinary lay folk, ordinary people. Uh, A number of them embrace celibacy, choose not to get married for the glory of God and more de- more explicit dedication and the service of the other members. But most of our members are married or could be married, men and women who find God through their family life. But if, a big thing for us is making holy work. The very word or the very two words, Opus Dei, means work of God. And it's all about our spirit. It's very, all about finding God through everyday life, through work. You know, a lot of it, everyday life involves a lot of work. It also involves the, the life of the home and the chores, but and the duties of the home, but also the joys of the home, um, but very much work. You know? And so an Opus Dei member should, if he, he or she lives his spirit well, should be an exemplary uh, colleague at work, should work very well with a positive spirit, should be very much be a, a plus sign, a force of union, um, with a stress on quality work, done with for the glory of God and for the service of others. And we'll have members in all, you know, everything from a street cleaner to a government minister, all sorts of possibilities. Yeah, it's really interesting. And and just several of my family members are are in the work. And it's 
it's always been quite interesting. So I, I know a bit about it. The way I like to the way I explain it to people, and you will probably kill me for this later, is for people, though, who aren't Catholic or maybe who aren't even Christian, the way I like to explain it is it's almost like mindfulness. It's almost the same concept that you're mindful in your work. So you're mindful of the of your spirituality and doing the right thing and treating people well and being a good example and, and bring sanctifying the work that you do. I know you probably on a, on all sorts of levels, that's totally wrong, but I try no. to try and make people who, who don't have the, the Catholic context to, you know, to yeah. kind of understand it. I, I always think that's the easiest way to maybe help people understand. I think it's not a bad start. I would say we would mindfulness with God and for God. It's not yeah. just it's not just thinking about yourself or gazing at your own belly button. Um, so you know we've we're Catholics, we're Christians, we firmly believe in God, and we have to live for God. So it's but I think it's not a bad way to start mindfulness for and with God. I like it. Good. Okay. Excellent. So one of the things, the big topics that keeps coming up all the time in almost every conversation, and I've been talking about this for nine months on, it, it comes up in every conversation that I have is always ethics. And we talk a lot and, and, you know, you, you mentioned navel gazing. There's a lot of navel gazing in the AI community. I think about ethics and, and what that means, but I've always wondered like, what's the moral aspect to it? And, and I know that today they, they're almost synonymous, but i I always, when I was taught, when I was, and I'm, I'm in my mid fifties now. So, you know, when I was being taught back in the seventies, it was, they were taught as kind of your morals or your internal compass, whereas ethics are kind of an external thing that business have. And I was wondering, A, is that even correct? I mean, I assume that maybe the thoughts moved on since then and B, can you sort of explain what the difference is between the two? So that again, we have some context around this conversation and what we're thinking about. Good. Yes. I think in practice today they are seen as the same as um, different. Sorry, as you've put it, they are seen as as you exactly you put it in very nicely. The morals, your internal compass, uh, ethics, what you expected from society, the right thing to do. Um, that wasn't always the way it's been seen. Um, a very famous work on morality, uh, one of the great classics, um, long before Christianity, by the way, one of the great classics of thought is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And it's all about the internal compass. It's how you can be a good person, a good man or a good woman. So in recent decades, they've tended to make this distinction has grown up. And it's not, it's, you know, language evolves and sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing. The only problem there, however, is ethics can easily get reduced to legality and what you can get away with, what you have to do, Bus business guidelines. Yep. That, for example, typically happens in medicine, medical ethics more and more is being taught as what is legal and what's not legal. But of course, um, you, can't, you can't load together uh, legality and morality. Something potentially could be legal and immoral, um, or something could be, I mean, the Nazis caught you making laws against the Jews, which were all, uh, all immoral, totally yeah. immoral. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, morality is profoundly internal. Ethics should be profoundly internal. So I don't mind the distinction, as long as it's really understood that um, ethics can't be reduced to just legality or what you can get away with or, or what you can't get away with, Bus business guidelines. It's got to be more. It's got to come from the inside. Interesting. Okay, so I had it backwards. So that's that's good. Good good learning point already. Um, and so the other, I think, wrinkle that we talk about a lot is, or my question that I always have is, and maybe we'll – the term natural law is going to come out here, <laughs> um, Good term. but, uh, but I think, I think there is a concept that there's like this natural law, which I think almost every religion in the world agrees on a few core yeah. principles. You know, you don't kill people, treat people like you want to be treated. Yeah. I think there's some, some very core tenets that everybody agrees on. And then what happens is, is, is you get all the details around the edges and it's all the what you can eat and what you can say and who you can talk mm. to and when you need to do this and when you need to do that, that have divided everybody. But the, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that when you get into the ethics discussion, particularly around technology and in the workplace, you start getting people who have different views about how what should be done here or who should be done, you know, how something should be done. 
And I'm curious to know what you think about how, how you start to bring all that together, because we're, what, we can end up in a situation where we've got some AI that's built in the Far East, where they may have a very different set of ethics that they live by, or societal ethics, maybe. And then we've got the West and we've got Silicon Valley, which has a whole another set of its own ethics that lives just in California. And I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on how you think we might be able to pull all that together? Mm. Yes, natural law. Uh, I recommend uh, C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. We export talks about this quite interesting. And he makes the point there that you get in different forms of culture, there's always been some sort of sense of fundamental moral ethical values. Um, in Judaism, it's expressed mainly in the Torah, the, the, the first uh, the five books of the Bible, according to the Christian view. Um, in the Chinese culture, it's the Tao. There's basic rights and wrongs that um, either have to be done or avoided. And it's true, one can get into, I've, I remember as a university student, you get into heated arguments, there is a moral law, there isn't a moral law. There isn't a law, but I think fundamentally people eventually agree on something. You know, you could, you know, it's wrong to take innocent life. Of course, then you know, what is innocent life? What's not innocent life? Well, that's, but still, it's wrong to take innocent life. You shouldn't steal other people's property. Um, it's unfair to uh, you know, commit adultery. Um, there's, there's all sorts. Eventually, somewhere you can agree on some basic moral principles, and likewise, I think we can agree on some basic moral principles for the regulation of AI. The devil's in the detail, but we, and we do all the time agree on principles. I mean, a child can say, ah, oh, it's not fair. You know, a child without realizing it is, it's in our guts, it's in our instinct. The child is calling to some basic principle of justice. And at least I think we could sort of pinpoint some basic principles of justice, treating people properly. Um, I think we can do that much. And I think we need to do that much. Otherwise we're gonna have big problems. And you're right. I mean, we do have an international human rights agreement that exactly. I think every country in the world has signed up to. Exactly. The society functions on the basis of some accepted ethical moral principles. So how do we build on that? How do we build on that in what sense? For AI or in general? Well, for, yeah, for AI. I mean, in a, in a world where we're getting in a situation where I mean, I can, I can, the, where the technology is heading now is that anybody can create their own small AI tool to do whatever mm. they want it to do. Mm. And this is, I guess, where my, my sort of concept of morality comes in because we have to have, I think we have to rely on people having that internal compass yes. and some people don't, or some Correct. people have a different one than we have. Like your mm. moral compass is, is probably different than mine versus my wife versus someone I meet on the street. Mm. It may not be wildly different, but it's going to be slightly different. But some yes. people's are wildly different. Yes. And this is the the worry that I have is, does, does having that technology introduce another risk, a, like a moral risk or some sort of an ethical risk to us as people that maybe we haven't even considered yet? Yes, but only because of the power of the technology. I mean, I think we have to begin with the principle uh, that AI is good. Uh, I, as a, a Catholic, a priest, uh, would see AI as a great gift from God, a great expression of human um, creativity and intelligence. So I think we let's not start with sort of apocalyptic negative vision. Uh, I think it'd be wrong. And I would say, although, although we perhaps slipped up slightly with Galileo, uh, the church, I think, has, has quite a good record in promoting science uh, and precisely science developed within the, the Western world, really. So it's interesting that because there is a sense that um, you know, there is, you know, God is intelligent, God is logical. And there's a logic can be, that can be discovered. So I think we need to have a positive vision towards science, towards technology. However, the particular difficulty here or the danger is, of course, this new technology is especially powerful. That's the problem. Yeah. There have been technologies in the past which have been less less powerful and therefore less worrying. This is particularly powerful, and anybody who has a bit of knowledge can do a lot of harm. And, there are, and that's why I think we need to what we need to do is invest ever more in ethical formation. That's what we've got to do. Uh, I think 
um, governments, the industry has to work together. I think here, I think it's, sometimes people see the AI, the AI industry as the baddies. You know, we've got to keep them under control. These are, these are the, the, the danger. No, um, it's very interesting. There was a, um, um, a recent uh, meeting um, in, um, well, of course, I'm, I'm thinking about the, um, the, the COP meeting. Okay. And uh, in the end, in the early December, yep. end of November, early December. And it was interesting that it was quite controversial in the sense that the pe- some of the fossil fuel people were involved and this caused a lot of stir. Um, but I think it was a good idea because you've got to work together with everybody. And likewise, I think if we're going to follow form ethical principles and guidelines, um, you know, I think those outside the AI world mustn't see the AI world as enemies. The AI world mustn't themselves see themselves as sort of you know, we, 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 we're not understood. Um, or saviors. Nobody likes us. Um, or saviors. Or saviors, yeah, exactly. And I think let's work together. Um, I think then uh, there needs to be, a, and also I think it's important to bring into play here the wisdom of religion. Sometimes it can be a bit of sort of, you know, what's religion in this modern world, in this technological world, what's religion got to say? Well, at least religion expresses the wisdom of the ages. Uh, and the very fact that religion refuses to die uh, you know, it's got a lot of demand. Um, and sometimes, of course, just as sometimes people are afraid of AI, people are afraid of religions. Um, so I think, you know, let, let, there's a lot of wisdom in religion. I think I would say particularly, obviously I'm biased, but the Catholic Church has a tremendous tradition of ethical thought, moral study. Uh, there's a lot to offer there. So let's get around the table. Let's work together. Um, and let's see how we can form people ever more in a proper responsible use of AI, aiming for the not you know not just for the our own personal selfish ends, but for the good of all, the common good. That notion of common good, what is truly good for all. No, I like that. What's I just want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned I think you said ethical formation. What, yes. What does that mean? Good. Thank you. That's a, yes, I can. They, basically, we're in a situation where. It's a curious age, it's a great age, but it's an age where we have ever more technological power and technical ability. But somehow we seem ever more confused about ethics as a society. Um, I don't want to get into too many details, but, you know, because it's, these are get, get controversial. But, um, you know, whole, the... That's uh, perfect. Gender, Go for it. I call it gender ideology, you know, is... Uh, is a very, you know a classic example of, of confusion. You know people people are now you know even confused about what it means to be a person. Um, tremendous confusion, tremendous moral confusion, and also a surprising. This is one of the surprising things: a surprising self hatred. That um, more and more, you get an idea is coming across where the human person is bad. The human person is is you know is the danger, is the threat. That comes across in forms of uh, cinema. Um, Avatar is a good example, you know, where it comes in, in popular culture, um, where more and more humans are bad. Uh, sometimes nature's good, or what we've got to do is if we can get beyond the humans and, and invent you know, tech robots that sort of do without humans, then everything will be better. So I think, no, we need to see humans as good. We are part of the solution. Uh, not part of the problem. We can be part of the problem, but we're also part of the solution. And work together to to understand ever more better clearly the ideas of the human person. That, by, that's what I mean by ethical formation. We don't understand ourselves. We seem to hate ourselves. We seem to be seeking our own extinction. There's a profound pessimism uh, about the human person. Um, we need to value ever more what it means to be human. Also going back to the classics like Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, the medieval thinkers, there's tremendous wisdom there about the human person. Um, and we need to look at that again and understand it. I often, you know, say, for example, people don't even know the vocabulary of, of goodness now. So you ask someone to explain what a virtue is. Um, they might not be able to do it. Many people wouldn't even know what a virtue is, let alone live it. Uh, yeah. Whereas you, at least you go back, you go back to the Victorians. I'm not saying the Victorians were perfect. I'm not. I'm the last person to think we we need to go back to some sort of golden age. I'm very happy to be living where I am now. I'm very comfortable in it. But you know, ages. Some ages have better things. Some ages have worse things. We have. There's lots of advances too. But you know, the Victorians were very clear about what virtues were, and they would talk about virtues, and they would distinguish virtues. You go to the Bible uh, and the ancient, the Old Testament, the ancient world. There's a tremendous tradition of wisdom. There's various books all about wisdom in the Bible. Nobody cares about wisdom anymore. No, you, know, you want to look good or be sexy or health, you know, look young and healthy. 
who cares about wisdom? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a shame that we've lost that. You know, what does it mean to be wise? What is wisdom? What is virtue? What is the good life? That's what I, that's ethical formation that we're really properly looking at these questions. And again, bringing on board the wisdom of the ages, the wisdom of the great Greek philosophers, the wisdom of religion, the wisdom of the church, the wisdom of the medieval doctors. That's ethical. Looking at all that again with greater depth and not thinking that somehow, and this is a typical problem, that somehow you know, everything began in the 19th century um, or even not now sometimes in the 20th century. Of course, another big, big problem, um, I'm talking about problems. There's also lots of tremendous opportunities in good, but another big problem is that confusion that the thought that be, because we can do something means we 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 should do it um and there's a loss of self control there's a loss of uh recognizing our limits we need to control ourselves that's part of ethical responsibility again that's the danger we have ever more technical technical ability but nevertheless ethical knowledge uh the so learning you know what does it mean you know, learning to control ourselves, that, that, that's a big problem of our age. Pope Francis talks about that, particularly in the aspect of cons uh, consumerism. He talks of a feverish consumerism, which is harming the planet. So it's interesting how Pope, Pope Francis brings into, brings into play or brings together two very interesting aspects. One is concern for the environment. And another thing he call, what he calls, it's a bit of a technical term, but it, 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 once you explain it, it makes a lot of sense, what he calls a technocratic paradigm. Now, the technocratic paradigm, again, is the idea that if you can do it, it's right to do it. Now, whatever you can get away with, whatever you can technically do, you can do it. Or technology will solve all our problems. All we need is a technical solution. Where, so we can, you know, we can pollute as much as we like, uh, but as long as we, you know, we can deal with it, we can deal with the fallout technologically. We can damage our bodies as much as we like, as long as we've got statins or whatever it is to, yeah. to limit the, da the damage. Yeah. Um, and, like, and, and technology can come into this. Now, technology can do a tremendous amount of good, to, to enormous amount. We're having this conversation, this wonderful communication we're, through technology. So again, we have to be open to the many possibilities. But you know, that, be, be careful with that idea that somehow um, there's a technological solution to everything, um, that just because we have the technological ability, it's right to do it. It might not be. We can blow up you know, nuclear power. We can blow ourselves up. Um, yeah. sometimes we have to say no to ourselves and realize this, the solution is more than technology and we might have to go slower and say that don't go down there that will harm us things like again speaking as a Catholic priest but um, experimentation on embryos you know, is it right is it is it the right way to go I mean do we know what we're doing so much of so much of our research we don't even know what we're doing uh, you know we don't quite know the harm it could have genetical manipulation you know, maybe we need to go slower and say, is this right before we start doing it? Sometimes, but too often, we, we start doing it and ask moral questions later. 100%. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, the perfect example is we, I mean, we could sit and talk through so many examples where there have been massive unintended consequences that have come yeah. after a new technology like social media, yeah. for example. Yeah. It was all well and good and it was great fun in the beginning. And, you know, people were talking to each other and we had this wonderful, amazing, you know, ability to communicate. And, you know, we were talking to people across the world and it was all really mm. good until mm. it wasn't. And mm. then, you know, then the bad actors started getting involved and then people who, you know, wanted to just cause trouble and then you, you know, and, the, and then the bad bits started coming in. And now what we're realizing is that that's caused, you know, psychological problems in, in, in teens and in young people who've grown mm. up with the internet and they've got, you know, they've got Addictions. all this dysmorphia they've got body dysmorphia yeah. they've got all these things and social yeah. anxiety and all these other things that have come off the back of it which no you might have guessed but hindsight's 2020 so at the time mm. you know it's it's really difficult and it's uh, silicon valley and a lot of the tech not just silicon valley but i just say that as a representative of the tech yeah, industry exactly. in tech general world, yeah. almost always start off in a very basic altruistic way and yeah. they really do believe that what they're doing is good and that you know they couldn't possibly believe that somebody would use it for to do something bad because that thought because they're not bad people and they genuine genuinely that thought doesn't even really enter their head until you start to 
really push back on them and say, but what about this? And they go, mm. but no one would do that. <laughs> like, okay, mm. maybe you need to start to think about this a bit differently. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, you mentioned medicine and I don't, I generally don't talk about personal life, but I've had some experiences, particularly with stem cells and some of the stem cell research in the past. And I know, for example, at the University of Tennessee, they got in massive legal trouble in the U.S. because they were aborting healthy babies so that they could yeah. sell the stem cell, yeah. um, the stem cells to for researchers and to do research with. And people can look it up. It was a it was a case in the U.S. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's horrible. So, yep. you know, stuff like that does happen. Um, it, it definitely happens. Where, since I'm trying to think of how I want to ask what I want to ask, I just I just spit it out. Um, I think what we're seeing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I totally may be wrong. This is just my anecdotal feeling, but it feels like we're we're in a situation where, certainly in the West, I'll I'll keep it kind of to the West, which is, you know, sort of Europe and, and the U.S. and that sort of thing. It feels like for the last few decades that religion has been decreasing or yes. certainly involvement in religion has been decreasing. Yes. In the I West, think, in, in, in other places, growing Africa, yeah. Asia. Yeah. But yes, in, in, in the West, without doubt. Exactly. That's why I sort of corrected myself because yeah. I was thinking about that. Um, where, with that going on, and people not paying so much attention to religion, whether it's Catholic or else. Yeah. How do we start to then have those ethical discussions and how do we try and get people back to some level of, of thinking about their ethical formation? The, um, through discussions like this is one way. <laughs> I think we, uh, I think um, Christians also, have to get out there and and people of religion have to get out there and get across these ideas. Sometimes we got our own, we only got ourselves to blame that we, we also need, and that means professional competence. You need to know what you're talking about. Um, so I think part of it is us getting out there, getting across these good ideas because we've got these amazing ideas. Wonderful. You know, all this tremendous tradition, but nobody knows it. Um, so I think education on our part, um, but I think also people have to start asking themselves questions that, you know, let's, you know, really where have we taken ourselves? Um, you know, has, are we any better uh, for having ignored religion? You know, are we, the, the divorce rates go up, mental health problems go up, um, you know, wealth goes up, although even now, you know, it's still, it went up for a while, but this now, you know, it's not yeah. necessarily going up everywhere, and certainly not in Europe, you know, there's serious economic questions that are being asked, you know. Um, the um, demographic problem, you know, the question, the birth rates are declining. You know, are are we any? I think people have to ask themselves: Are we any better off, really, for having rejected religion? Maybe it's time to to go back and listen to what religion had had to say. And some, you know, we, you know, in some of these areas where we've been warning people, you know, for example, the Catholic Church: good to have children, be open to life. Uh, money isn't everything. Um, you know, things like that. Judge first. Be more concerned about the. Uh, the ethical consequences and the financial profit. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's, I think it's, people need to realise, yeah, maybe all that we've done, and we got a bit dazzled by it, uh, as can happen, and a bit what, like what you're talking about, you know, for example, social media. Yeah. And um, we've harmed I mean, I, I think that wonderful story, uh, I don't know who it comes from, but um, I'm sure you've heard it. The the children who had, the, 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 who had these powers to, in a room, they could go into a room and make anything they liked. You know, they could that room. They could turn that room into anything they wanted, and they were having a tremendous fun, all sorts of wonderful games in that room. Until one day, they decided to turn the room into a jungle, and they went in and were eaten by wild beasts. Right. Um, you know, and maybe we've got ourselves a bit into that situation in the Western world. Uh, some of the wonderful world th things that we've created are in danger of eating us up, and before it's too late, let's start listening to some of the wisdom of the past. That's really interesting, and I. I've never, I haven't actually heard that, that before. So that's, that's interesting to think about. And I think you're right. But I think in a, in a weirdly ironic way, the, the drive of the technology, I think is actually forcing people, forcing, but causing people to have these discussions because ethics now has become such a hot topic. Yeah. You know, even though it's, it, it's, 
maybe the understanding of it is a little different than it has been traditionally and that sort of thing. But at least it's like a starting point and people are starting yeah. to, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about bias in the data as well. And what's interesting is, is bias is different than ethics, but then there's an ethical element to deciding what you do about the bias. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, do you fix it or do you leave it? And, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've talked about this several times and, and I, I'm undecided because I'm nervous that if you start pushing a narrative of some fiction that doesn't exist, mm. what are the consequences of that? And are there some unintended consequences that we'll run into as mm. opposed to using the data as a mirror to say, wow, there's a lot of bias out there. There's a lot of prejudice mm. out there. And for mm. us to then be able to work on that because we can see what's happening. Mm. Um, I'm not really sure where that is, but again, there's that ethical, I think an ethical and moral aspect that, that comes into the, you know, to the base of making those decisions. Definitely. I think it made, you made me think of that well-known uh, statement applied, usually applied to politics, with great power comes great responsibility. But I think we're seeing with, with, the, with the IA, with, with AI, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think AI practitioners are probably seeing that too. Uh, also, sometimes because we're finding ourselves, all of us, uh, both uh, anybody using AI at whatever level, both the experts and the amateurs, we're all finding ourselves somehow um, affected by it. Sometimes the victims, um, they, you know, that um, suddenly you're getting, you're getting um, also, you know, you talk about bias as an example, um, manipulation, political manip- manipulation. You know, all the, the the whole question about Cambridge analytics and the elections and all these sort of things, you know, suddenly we're finding that this, this affects me. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, or, you know, then, then, then real threats in the world, so um, vigilance, you know, there were, for example, China, the whole thing of um, social credit, you know, there's a system in China where, you know, you, you, they got you completely monitored uh, and anything you do wrong, you lose a bit of credit and that can affect your life. It can affect your ability to travel. It can you really so it can become a form of, sort of prison, really. Uh, monitoring, you know, where, wherever we go, there are cameras. Um, yep. that the we're in danger of living in ever smaller worlds because of echo chambers. That the the lo- the algorithms work out what we're interested in, and that's that comes up on our feed. So I think we're finding ag- all of us are finding again and again this affects me, and I think possibly this could be a wake up. Also recognizing, you know, particularly on the internet and social media, there's a lot of good out there. But there's also a lot of rubbish, a lot of crazy things out there, um, and we're seeing that. And, and hopefully this will lead people to ask, as you say, ethical questions. You know, this, 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 there are dangers here. There's a lot of good opportunities, but there are dangers. I do need to think more ethically. Yeah. No, and I, I hope, fingers crossed, that it ultimately pushes people that way and that, you know, it does yeah. become a little bit more of an open discussion than it has been in the yeah. past. Right. That's been quite a heavy conversation so far. And we've, we've dug into, to a lot of stuff there. I want to, slightly change a little bit and ask okay. have you ever used ai or do you use ai yourself well it depends what you mean by AI. i haven't yet got to chat J- chat gpt right. uh, uh i like to uh develop my own material i mean i suppose obviously it depends depends what you mean by ai i mean everything anything computerizes ai in a sense but but no in yeah. the sense of uh somehow um the um, you know computers sort of generating their own intelligence. Of course, this does lead to the question: to what extent can computers be intelligent? But perhaps we can come to that one afterwards. Um, so I think no. I have to confess, I'm not a very technical person. That's okay. It's I'm always curious because some people I talk to do, and some people don't, and some yeah. people have dabbled with you know. Yeah. And and I I appreciate the nuance. You know, when I say AI, AI I usually mean the more generative, the newer tools generative, that have kind okay, of been around gen- in the no, last. The yeah. more generative type. No, I do yeah. know priests uh, who do use it, who are very into it. Uh, certainly, a lot of you know. Christian and Catholic lay people that use it a lot. Um, so there's no, in that sense, I think we're all very familiar with it and very happy with it. There's no fear of it. There's, we mustn't be Luddites, sort of destroy, you know, seeing technology as bad and trying to des- destroy it. But no, I, I confess, I myself am a rather untechnological person. The Pope even has a head of AI. Yeah, and yes, he's just brought somebody in. This uh, uh, not confusing, uh, uh, a curious choice. He's a Franciscan. You know, the Franciscan yeah. is a is a a type of friar, a type of I suppose monk. You might say, well, not strict, you know, light monks, um, who are supposed to be very sort of particularly cut off from the world. But uh, the, clearly, this guy is is an expert in the topic. And the, and the, actually, I would very much anybody who wants to get a good sense of 
the most recent Catholic teaching on AI, I would very, very much recommend something which is only from the 1st of January 2024 by Pope Francis. Uh, it's his world, every, every 1st of January is in the Catholic Church is the World Day of Peace. And the Pope always produces some discourse. Or, and this year's one uh, is all about AI, AI and peace, uh, how it can contribute to peace, how it can threaten peace. So if anybody just wants to find that, just look up Google, um, Pope Francis, World Day of Peace 2024. They'll find it. Yeah, and I'll actually put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah. So if it's, anybody's... A fascinating, it's a very complete and fascinating day and very positive and very open to the good in AI. Is that... So from your understanding, what's the what's the church's position? I mean, I know you're not a, an official spokesman for the church, so Correct. I'll put that out there. So this is yeah. your own opinion, but exactly. what's kind of your, what's your feeling? What, the, like how the church thinks about it in general? Like if, you, do you, does it ever come up in conversations when you're with other priests, you're with other clergy or anybody sort of away from the public? Does it ever come up as a topic of conversation? Uh, not desperately. I, um, I think uh, mainly also probably because, uh, at least in the West, quite a lot of the priests are older and I think they're not really, they're not into it. Although I, I also quite a lot of young priests. Uh, I can think, I know a few priests who are, who are techies uh, and uh, who, are, who do know all about it. Um, it doesn't, so I wouldn't say it comes up in priest conversation, it, but it is coming up more and more in church documents and church teaching. Uh, so you meant, I mentioned the one of the World Day of Peace. You mentioned this, this guy who's just been appointed as the sort of the church's you know, principal representative spokesman on, on AI or um, the, um, I haven't had time to look at it yet, but uh, a lead in figure from the Vatican uh, was in some place, I can't remember where, but it was in some place and uh, gave an important speech uh, in Africa somewhere and gave a speech about AI. Uh, you're, you're seeing it coming up more and more. What's the church's business? I think, again, fundamentally positive, uh, fundamentally positive. This is, a, this is a gift from God and, um, an expression of human creativity, um, but uh, with risks. And but you know, and it, we're not gods. I think that's the de- that's the message. We're not gods. We can't see ourselves as, go- as gods. Uh, only God is God, and we have to recognise our limits. And also that very talking about going back to virtues, that important virtue of prudence. You know, be careful. Uh, prudence is all about knowing how to do things. That you know, what what well, having a sense of what's the right thing to do, uh, not going beyond ourselves and the right way to go about it. Uh, so I think um, that would be the position. I, I, that, you're absolutely right. I'm very far from being a spokesman. Uh, I'm here just in my little outpost in Oxford. Um, but um, the, from, from what I'm seeing, I am definitely seeing more and more teaching on, by the church on the question uh, and um, pointing to its positive, but recognising the dangers. Do you think we should be nice to it? To AI. Yes, we should be nice to everybody. But also, I think, again, what I said earlier, you know, bring AI people into the discussion. They're not the devil incarnate. You know, they're not, uh, there's, it, it's a great thing, you know, and I, if to all the AI people listen to me now, I'd say, God bless you. Keep, you know, thank, thank you for all you're doing. May God bless you for all you're doing. But, you know, keep alive your ethical sense. See what you can do to study a bit more good ethics. Um, but uh, no, definitely not. You know, we should work together. And this is a great gift and a great opportunity if we use it properly. And it can do all sorts of wonderful things for human flourishing, medical uh, advancement, the development of culture, making our lives better. And Pope Francis, again, talks a bit about that. Yeah, there's some some of the medical stuff I've talked about quite a lot in the past yeah, around well, the, the breast cancer research and all that came out of Oxford as well. And um, that's where I, I went to an event a, a year ago now, I guess, um, where they were talking about that and some of that stuff is really interesting. So you're absolutely right. There's, there's tons of potential upside to it as well. And we need to, to be mindful of that. I'm, I'm glass half full kind of guy most of the time. Yeah, me anyway. too, me too, me too. You know, and I, I think I tend to want to think the best of people, but then I see what people do and I wonder <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> AI is, you know, is only as good as the ethical attitude of the person coding it. Or um, using it. Or using it, exactly, using or coding, you're absolutely right. Um, so again, it comes back to ethical formation, helping people have a better sense of ethics, uh, discussions. We've got to get back to uh, a deeper understanding, a deeper study of the human person. Um, and again, you know, computer, and then I think perhaps we are a little bit, 
fast, we're a bit dazzled by our technology. We're in, we're in that stage where we're still dazzled by what we can do. Um, and we need to, I think there's a little bit, a little bit of calming down needed here. Just, you know, keep calm, don't panic, but don't get intoxicated either. Um, and realize the limitations of, of computers. Um, people think, oh, well, one day, you know, they will be able to, well, mm, you know, computers can't suffer. You can't punish a computer for wrongdoing. I mean, obviously you can yep. turn it off and throw it away. But it doesn't but, care. Um, but it's not, you know, the computer doesn't know, the computer doesn't care. Uh, but we do. I think, again, let's fall more and more in love with the human person. You know, I think some, sometimes, um, you know, we men, <laughs> we complain about women and we, women being whimsical and changing their mind. But actually, that's a marvellous expression of humanity, you know, um, you know, to be whimsical is a great, I mean, you know, it has its faults and all that, but it shows tremendous subtlety. It shows tremendous, per computers can't really be whimsical. No. Um, you know, we need to understand more and more, you know, our ability for love, for concern, for empathy, vulnerability. And it's good that we're vulnerable. It's good that we are weak. It's good that we need each other. Also, perhaps the importance of face-to-face -face relations. That, that could be, I think, that something that we could all sort of work on more. How can we develop face-to-face -face relations. Pope Francis again says something very interesting. He says that you know, the danger of um, relationships that you can turn off with the click of a button. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, you can get bored of something, you turn it off, but you can't necessarily, get, you can't necessarily turn off your, your elderly granny, you know, who's actually a wonderful person, yeah. but can be, you know, because she's deaf or not very well, can be a bit tiresome. Of course, some people would like to do that for euthanasia. Yeah. Uh, but that, again, yeah. is a, it, you know, it's a failure to engage with the real person in, in their dignity. So again, it's, more and more appreciating the dignity of the human person and the value of interpersonal relations. Yeah, that's a whole different topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's an important topic, that's a, and it's, link, yeah, it's linked yeah. to AI. But something interesting that you there were a couple of things in there, but but one of them in particular, you talked about. You know, you can just turn it off, and it doesn't have that kind of fear. And what's really interesting is that. Um, there's a show on Netflix that I've talked about a couple of times and it talks about AI and it gives an example of AI in combat. And they basically taught AI to fly a fighter jet and then they put it in competition with a real human pilot. And I won't go through all the detail, but what what's relevant to what you were saying and, and reinforces your point is that, I mean, it took out the human pilot. Spoiler alert, it took out the human pilot in like two minutes every time. It will all, and it will always win. You know, AI yeah. will always win. And it, and, but the reason the pilot thought it was really interesting because he said what it does is it does a move that a human would never do, which is fly directly at the other plane. So they never, if, if there's a dogfight, which is, I mean, I never really thought about it, but if they're in a dogfight, they never fly straight yeah. at each other because you can both shoot each other immediately. So yeah. they always attack from the side or from the back. And the AI worked out very quickly that the human pilots didn't like to do that and that that was a winning strategy. So it mm -hmm. literally just went straight for them every time. Yeah. And and there's, there is something to that self-preservation gene yeah. that even in a combat situation where you, it's That's life or death, there's still something you won't do because yeah. it's too risky. And, yeah. and the AI doesn't have that. Yeah. And that's what's going to be really, I think, potentially, you know, it's going to be really, I don't want to say interesting because it, in one sense it'll be interesting, but that's quite scary that it doesn't have that limiting factor of, well, it, it cares if someone turns it off, like it doesn't yeah. matter. And yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting wrinkle to it. Well, I think sure. that's a fascinating point. That, and also I think that points to the dignity of the human person, that humanity is so precious that somehow, you know, even in that most extreme situation of warfare, we want to preserve ourselves. We instinctively we know there's something worth preserving, which a computer doesn't necessarily have. You know, what what is the value of something that doesn't know that it's worth preserving? That doesn't what is the value of something that doesn't appreciate its own dignity? Well, and of course it doesn't appreciate its own dignity because it's a lump of metal and cables when all is said and done. Yeah. Uh, whereas yeah. you and I, human beings, we're not just a lump of flesh and wires or nerves. We're much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're at sort of 45 minutes already. There is one thing I did want to come back to, though, that you mentioned. 
um, a few minutes ago, which was talking about intelligence. And I think you had something that you wanted to say around human intelligence versus the sort of machine intelligence. Did you have something you wanted to? They, um, yeah, well, just I think simply to say, you know, that, um, you know, that there is that debate about whether, you know, computers can be more intelligent than human beings. But I think we have to, what I, really my point was that intelligence is more, is more than technical know-how. Um, and we've got to appreciate that. You know, you go back to your very good example, you know, a, a compu the computer, the AI clearly, clearly, quickly worked out that they can take the plane down by going straight for it, you know. Um, but it didn't quickly work out or it didn't work out at all. The, you know, that the value of human life, the value of, you know, that pilot's got children, you know, that pilot's got a past and a present and a future. Um, even fear, you know, fear is a wonderful quality. I think, again, it's, We've got to sort of get back to, rather than sort of wanting to somehow get rid of humans in the name of technical efficiency. Again, efficiency is not everything. That's the point. I, you know, I would even say sometimes, for example, another another reason for going slower is, um, you know, how do we how does this affect human lives? Um, everything is not just efficiency. It's not just a wealth, uh, profits. People have to live. Um, so again, let's get back to valuing and understanding ever more human dignity and realizing that humanity is so much more than we realize and much more than mere technical knowledge that you can program into a computer, even if you can make it sort of generative of its own sort of processes. And I guess lastly, do you have any thoughts on, I think someone set up an AI religion already. <laughs> To, yes. uh, I'm not. I don't know if you've even heard about this, and and I don't know much no. about it, but um, it it just it just occurred to me to think about that. But yeah, somebody's already, you know, start, started this whole concept of kind of a religion based around AI, and um, I mean, I think it's crazy, but yeah. people are crazy. So yeah, exactly. Know. I think that's that. You know, people are crazy. Um, they we we can end up worshiping anything. You know, the idols. Uh, yeah. One of the big in the ancient world, and one of the big problems. You, one of the, if you look at the Old Testament in the Bible, you know, one of the big issues that the prophets are always dealing with is people setting up idols, you know, to, to, to work to worship the work of our hands, which in the end is self limiting because you're like you know they used to worship lumps of wood or animals or um, they, but uh, that is our, that we, we can be dazzled by that, and I think here too we have to be careful not to worship the work of our hands and to recognize our limits. Again, I think again and again. So human creative is a wonderful thing. AI is a wonderful thing. But we've got to recognize our limits. Otherwise, we can end up destroying ourselves or at the very least harming ourselves very, very badly. And here I think, again, we go back to I think, the need to, for some clear regulations. I know it's impossible to have absolute watertight regulations, also because AI moves so quickly, technology moves so quickly. But I think let's agree some, you know, some worldwide uh, principles uh, which then governments have to ap apply in their in their perspective in their respective uh, legislature, um, maybe an international body with authority recognised by all. Again, bring on bring in the AI business. They're not the enemies. They're the friends. You know, they um, they. I mean, I, I speak. I know we're all about because I'm a journalist by profession, and everybody thinks again. You know, the journalist that we're devils incarnate. You know, um, and uh, and we're not. <laughs> a journalist is just a, an honest bloke or girl doing their job, wanting to find, get information. Um, you're not I, the devil. Uh, you're just a minor spirit. Just a minor <laughs> evil spirit. Minor not you personally, spirit. but journalists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> you know, I think people are fundamentally good. Actually, I think we need to get, we get back to that. People are fundamentally, and generally want to do the right thing. And we have to recognize that. So let's get everyone involved. Let's get some principles. Uh, let's develop our knowledge of ethics and of the human person. And I think that will be the, uh, international agreements, international federations, perhaps cooperation. I think that's the way forward. Brilliant. And when you have a an AI assistant sometime in the next few years, what do what do you think you might name it? Um, they um, well, uh, uh, probably uh, because of my magazine Adama. I think I'd call him Adama. Just just because uh, I've been so happy with Adama, <clears throat> and it's a lovely magazine. And so that's a great name. I have a friend named Adama and she's a lovely human as well. So really? that's a great name. And you, do yeah. you know what Adama means? Adama means earth, soil. And that's the whole purpose. The idea, the idea of our magazine is we want Adam comes from Adama. The human person comes from the soil. So we, we right. want the magazine to be uh, a, play, a space where the human person can flourish, can arise. 
So again, always we want that's what, and I get. I think for all the whole AI world, all the people involved in this, let's work together for the human person to flourish. Totally agree. And where can people? Is there? I mean, obviously they can. You've got a website for Adama, so tell everybody yeah. where they can find that. Well, just Google Adama A D A M A H Media. Okay. Uh, they'll find it. And anything else you have you want to promote? Uh, well, I. The, the, I um, well, I run this um, for, for those who are more Christians and want to pray to be helped to pray. I run. I, I'm lead coordinator of this daily meditation. It's called Ten Minutes with Jesus. So it's like a daily ten minute meditation. Again, just Google Ten Minutes with Jesus. You'll find it. Um, and it's just a way to help people pray and the, as they're going through life on their journey to work. Um, just a very lovely way to connect with God. Brilliant. I'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes Fantastic. as well. So if people are looking at it, you can just click on the link. I'll make it that easy so that they don't have to even Wonderful. Google it. Wonderful. Father Joe, thank you very much for your time today. It's been really interesting and I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy I was able to have this conversation and to really to start to dig into it a little bit. Pleasure, David. I've really enjoyed it too. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. 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 Curious.